Um, if you're in my 30 level course, you probably have this as the first slide, but you might not if you're in the 20 course. Did I put that on my first slide? Okay, sorry I didn't. Apparently the notes are just slightly different between the two. They should still be the same though, right? Yeah, they are. Okay, they're just offset by one set. Um, I want to start off by talking historically about how mathematicians have known about trigonometry. Okay. Um, We've known that the Earth goes around the Sun for many, many years. Although there was some times during about the 16, 1700s where like Galileo said, hey guys, the Earth goes around the Sun. And the Catholic Church basically said, no, the this, this Earth is the center of the universe. And they, they put him under house arrest for his beliefs. You guys ever heard those stories before? But for the most part, mathematicians have known that the Earth goes around the Sun. It has actually led to the introduction of what we call a unit circle and, and how we measure angles. I know not all of you have this slide, but imagine that I were to take an xy coordinate grid. So this is going to be our y-axis, this is going to be our x-axis. Okay. In a way, the way in which the Earth goes around the sun uh, can kind of be plotted. Where over here, let's just say this is December, as the sun, as the Earth starts traveling in a circle, and we'll go around like this, we can actually kind of plot an angle. So let's just, for the sake of argument, let December be angle like when we start. Okay. After it's been a quarter of a year, I now have an angle in here that's, say, 90 degrees. You guys see how like the Earth has like, traveled around there? And then as it keeps traveling, eventually we might have an angle that if I compared it to where it originally started here, here we have a really large obtuse angle. Does that make sense? And I'm actually going to talk more about this idea as we go on in further slides. So, But why don't I start with my first note here. What I just showed you there is what we call a standard position angle. What we're going to do now is rather than working with triangles just anywhere, we're always going to plot a triangle on a coordinate axis. Okay. You guys that just finished doing grade 11 SOCA um, sine law, cosine law stuff, rather than just randomly drawing like a triangle just sitting right here, from now on what we're going to do is whenever we draw a triangle, one of the edges of your triangle is always going to go through 0, 0. We're always going to plot it on a grid. One side of the triangle always goes on the x-axis. Another side of the triangle is known as the terminal arm. And then the third side of the triangle, we sometimes don't even bother drawing that third side. We just kind of leave it open sometimes. But if you can kind of imagine, this is now your triangle. That is called a standard position angle. Let me show you some non-standard position angles just for just for reference. Here's a grid. There is a triangle. That is not in standard position. Fair enough. This one right here, not in standard position. I know one of the vertexes goes through the origin, but that's still not in standard position. In order for it to go through standard position, the requirements are Yes, one of the points has to be on the on the origin. One of your three sides has to go along here. And then the other one of the other random sides, like say goes, say like this. And then we just we just kind of fill in the blanks for the, for the third side there. Does that make sense? The reason why this is gonna matter is that this right here is an XY coordinate point, and we're eventually gonna solve this side right here as being what's known as the terminal arm, or sorry, that's the initial arm, initial arm, this one's initial, this one is the terminal arm, and it always ends at like a point. You guys kind of get what I'm saying when I'm talking about it being in standard position? Here's the reason why. I've got a picture, I'm going to skip two ahead here. Now, I just talked about the Earth going around the sun, and we, we know the Earth goes around the sun, not vice versa. But for many years, I mean, regardless of that, if you imagined, like, say, a person's perspective, the reason why we start in this quadrant right here, the reason why we start in this quadrant is actually based somewhat on this picture right here. It has to do not with the Earth around the sun, but the fact that as we watch the sun travel, where does the sun start from our perspective? The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. And this is kind of a three-dimensional picture to kind of show you, but over here is the east. The sun then rises and then sets. If I can go back to this picture right here, the reason why we start in this quadrant over here is because this is effectively east, this is west, this is north, 
this is south. And what we're doing is we're watching as this angle increases. See how there's kind of an angle inside here? As the angle gets bigger and bigger, it used to be that it started as the sun rises right about here. This is the sun just beginning. Does that make sense? And as the sun rises and gets higher and higher, eventually the angle, maybe I can rotate this. There we go. Eventually the sun gets a little bit higher until eventually the sun gets to like straight overhead. Now I know I wrote that as north, but what time of day is the sun basically straight overhead? Yeah, basically noon, right? And then the sun then starts to eventually set. And it's actually possible, I'll show you in a few slides, for us to have an obtuse angle. Actually, let's do it right now. We can actually plot an obtuse angle triangle, which would look like this. The sun, we're starting with our initial arm over here because this is where the sun would have originally risen from. And then eventually the sun could basically be sitting way over here. You can see how I can make a triangle? Oh, goodness, I suck at this. This is better. Yeah, let me, let me use a straight, I'll use a straight tool. I'll use a, a line tool. Here's going to be one edge. Here is the sun way over there. And then it's kind of implied that here's where I started. The sun has now gone up, come back down again. Now I made a triangle out of it. And you can actually make an obtuse triangle out of that. Does that make sense? So this is called standard position. So let me, let me go through like the, the notes kind of because I'm getting a little bit scattered here. This is called a standard position angle. And you might say, hang on, Chris. This doesn't look like it's a standard position angle, but it, but it still is. What it really means is that along this axis right here, that's where we started. We're then terminating it over here. There's kind of like a triangle between the three of these right here, and there's an angle in between there. Okay. Now, because sometimes we're going to get an obtuse angle, something that's larger than 90 degrees, we have another word. It's called a reference angle. And the way the reference angle works is it's always the acute angle the, the less than 90 degree angle that can be made to the x-axis. And if you can kind of see these pictures I have right here, you see how right here, this angle here is 115 degrees? There's a little angle right here, which is the remaining distance that the sun has to go before it eventually sets. We call that the reference angle. If the original angle is 115, can you guys tell me what the reference angle is? It's 65. Why is it 65? Because yeah, this adds to 180, right? Again, if I use this analogy right here, as the sun started here in the east and then went up in the sky and is starting to come back down, if I were to like to end the sun right here, really what I'm doing is I'm drawing a, uh, a triangle. I know it's in three dimensions, but that looks like this. This right here is 115 degrees, the remaining angle that's left until the sun finally comes down and lands flat again. Is, uh, is 65, because it has to add to 180. Does that make sense? So one of the first things I need everybody to be able to do is look at a an angle plotted on a grid and tell me what is the angle. But not only tell me what the angle is, tell me what the reference angle is. So for example, right here, take a stab. How, how far has this traveled? Like maybe 200? It's more than 180, right? Does that make sense? Like it's it's traveled all the way from its start position all the way through to 90. It's kept going all the way through here to 180, and it's kept going a little bit further. In this analogy here, this is the sun after it's set. Does the sun just like disappear for 12 hours in the middle of the night? Well, no, the sun is now on the other half of the Earth going around the circle. We can't see it because it's beyond our perspective. Does that make sense? So we can actually have an angle that's even larger than 180 degrees. Here, I've got an angle that, for the sake of argument, why don't we call it 200 degrees? It's a little bit more than 180. Now, we're going to call this the standard position angle. That's what we call it. Now, if the standard position angle is 200 degrees, though, there's a little angle right here which is like when I went a little bit too far, we would call that one the reference angle. How much is the reference angle going to be? Does that make sense why it's 20? Because it went 20 degrees further than, like, here would have been 180 degrees. This would have been 90. We're starting here at zero in the east. 
as we rotated around, we went 20 degrees too far. We call it a reference angle. Make sense? Let's try this one right here. If I were to tell you that this guy had a standard position angle, and let's say the standard position angle was 110 degrees, that means that from here to here is 110 degrees. Now, some people might say, okay, that means you went 20 degrees too far, right? Because 90 would be straight up. 20 more degrees is too far. But the, the default is always with the x-axis. And again, the reason why the x-axis makes sense is that this is our ground. And as the sun moves around, we just we always make our angles with the x-axis. That's been the defining angle. So what is this reference angle then? 70. Yeah, because 110 right here means we have 70 degrees more to go. Okay, now you guys are in grade 12. This isn't new to you. You guys have done this before. So I'm looking mostly at the grade 11s. Did that make sense so far? Okay. Well, what this means then is that we can plot triangles and angles in literally any of the four quadrants. You guys know the four quadrants, one, two, three, four. If you ever wondered why they start here with quadrant one, two, three, four, it's that same rationale, is that this is the east, this is the sun from our perspective rising in the east and going from east to west and then continuing its journey on the other side of the earth. So the reason why we start here is that this has literally been labeled as zero degrees. If you're going due east, it's like zero degrees. And as the angle increases and changes as you go around the circle, does that make sense? So that's why we start. This is quadrant one. This is quadrant two. But you can have angles on the negative side in quadrants three and quadrants four. That's still possible, actually. So I got some pictures here then that kind of show you how the reference angle would work in each of the four quadrants. If you are in this quadrant, Actually, this is kind of screwed up. Why does it say the first quadrant? This one's actually the second quadrant, right? Because this is one, two, three, four. This one should be the second quadrant. Hmm. This one right here, can you guys see how the angle right here has gone around to here? And then this is the reference angle? If you're in the second quadrant, your angle has to be anywhere between 90 degrees and 180 degrees. Because right here would be 90. And right here would be 180. And we're talking somewhere around here is where it would be. I think they're doing first, second, third, fourth just because they're doing them in uh, clockwise order. Because then this is actually the first quadrant, right? Like this is quadrant one, this is quadrant two, this is quadrant three, this is quadrant four. In this one right here, i got to point out the reference angle is the standard position angle. Does that make sense at all? Like in this quadrant right here, it's not that you've started rotating too far and there's like a little leftover bit. This one right here, whatever your actual angle is, is your reference angle. And these guys would have to be between 90 degrees and zero degrees. Now, if you kept rotating and you started going past 180 degrees, if you're in quadrant three, you're going to have a reference angle that gets made like with a little bit of excess right here. Uh, your angle, though, is going to be between 180 degrees and uh, 270. Because right here, at straight down, that'll be 270. And then how many degrees are in a circle? 360, which means that in this quadrant right here, it's somewhere between the 270 degree marker and the 360 degree marker. And here, you've basically gone almost all the way around the circle, and there's just a little bit left over that you haven't finished. Sound good? Today is a lot of uh, terminology. We need to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. If you guys are comfortable with the term reference angle and standard position angle. Um, okay, I want to talk about on this slide here how there's different ways you can even measure angles. Take a stab at this measurement of angle. How, how big do you think it about happens to be? What would you say? Uh, I'm going to go a little more than 45. 45 would be exactly half. Why don't I go 50 degrees? You guys agree, though, that that's roughly the angle? Now, if you're traveling this way like this, that's perfect. But what happens if you go backwards? 
Grid 12. So you guys remember what happens when you go the other way around the circle? What do we do? It's a negative number, yeah. So if you go backwards around the circle, this might be like, say, negative 120 degrees. The reason why it's negative is that I'm telling you to go the other way around the circle. So if you go counterclockwise, we make them positive angles. But if you go count, if you go clockwise, we actually make them negative angles. That's all. Now, this last example tries to illustrate the idea that you can actually go in more than a full circle. Any of you guys snowboard? What's a 1080? If you can pull off a 1080, anybody know? Okay, what's a 360? You do like a full loop, right? Okay, I'm not trying to hurt myself. Yeah, it's okay. So you're snowboarding this way, right? And you're about to do like a really awesome flip. Can you do... Oh, yeah. yeah. No, I just did a 360, right? Okay. But what happens if I went a little bit too far? So I was first this way here. See how I rotated a little bit too far? Okay. What I ended up doing was like say a 390 or a 400 degrees where I did a full circle and I went a little bit further. That's what this picture right here shows. And you've gone all the way around the circle and now you're back on day two. Use the example of the sun going around the earth again. Right? Not only has it gone all the way around, it's gone a little bit further again. So it's actually possible for us to have an angle of something like, say, 390 degrees. Does that make sense? What's the reference angle? 30. Because from here to here is 30 degrees. I, I, went to, I did a full 360, and then I went 30 degrees more. And so you have a reference angle of 30 degrees, but you actually went all the way around plus more. Make sense? So we can end up then having angles. It seems weird, but we can actually have negative angles. We can have angles that are greater than 90 and 180. We can have we can have an angle of 500 degrees. An angle of 500 degrees just means you've gone all the way around the circle once. That's 360. And then we need what another 140 to get to 500 degrees. So that means that I need to keep going and like end up about there. That's 500 degrees all the way around plus a little more. So back to the snowboarding talk, if you know what a 1080 is, a 1080 is one of the hardest things to do. It's actually three full rotations, right? 360 plus 360 is 720, plus another 360 is a 1080. If you can pull off a 1080, you're doing... That's pretty good. Anyways. Okay, so now that we've got the terminology out of the way as to how to label these things, one of the things we're going to want to work with is something called exact values. Okay. Whenever we work in the sciences especially, some of you guys know this already, we, we hate rounding. Rounding is bad. Okay. If, if it ever possible, we'd rather try to keep an unrounded number. And I've already shown you guys this to some degree in math. For example, if I gave you the quadratic formula, negative 3 plus or minus root 15 over 2, I actually prefer for you guys to leave it at that. Does that make sense? Because that is not rounded. If you were to tell me that this is a 3.09, I'm sure it's not, but let's say it's 3.09. That's that. Is as soon as you round, well, maybe it was 3.9452. Now when we're losing digits. Right? So the goal I've got in trigonometry is when we measure things, we often want to use exact values. Let me show you how this works. Okay. I'm going to start with a basic example. I'm not going to do this on a grid. We'll just solve this, and then we'll come back to grids in a bit here. Let's say that you're playing baseball. Um, if you guys don't know this, in baseball, the way it works, it's a perfect diamond. It's actually a perfect square, and it's 90 feet between each of the bases to each other. Okay. Now, let's say that I wanted you to, from home plate, throw the baseball to second base, maybe because someone's trying to steal, if you get what that means in baseball. My question here is, how far is this distance right here? Well... Here, here's what most people would do. They'd say, okay, well, this is a nice right angle triangle. They'd use Pythagoras' theorem. And they'd say that this side could be A, this side could be B, and this side C. Can you guys see how there's like a triangle right there? So using Pythagoras' theorem, you'd say, well, we need 90 squared plus 90 squared. That'll equal C squared. So 90 squared plus 90 squared, I get uh, 
1620. So then if I square root that, you might be inclined to say, okay, it's 127.3. Shaking your head, no. This has been rounded. We don't like that. We don't like to round things if we can avoid it. So probably the better way of leaving it would be to say, like, when we square rooted this, remember how, like, 16,200, you can, like, break that down into, like, smaller values? Like, for example, I can break this up into uh, 162 and 100. The reason I would break it up into 162 and 100 is that I can actually square root 100. 100 square roots to 10, so I could call it 10 root 162. I can actually do better than that. 162 breaks up into 81 and 2. Why did I pick 81 and 2? 81 square roots to 9. So the best answer for this would be 90 root 2. And this is considered to be an exact value. What I want to show you guys today is how to try to work with exact values a bit more. Rather than getting an answer of 153.57, we'd like to make it in terms of like root twos or root threes. That's more exact. Does that make sense so far? So what I want to show you here is two very common triangles. Um, they're known as either the 30-60-90 triangle or the 45-45-90 triangle. Um, they're very common because 30 degrees and 60 degrees are exactly double each other, right? Like 30 times by 2 gives 60. Uh, 30 times by 3 gives 90. Like it's a, it's a nice ratio. And then 45, 45, 90 is nice because both these angles are the same. And I'll show you how, um, how, how mathematicians have decided, have discovered how they can use exact values using these two triangles here. Uh, I want to start with the uh, 30, 60, 90 triangle. Pretend that it actually was twice as wide. Hypothetically, pretend that it actually was doubled. And what we're going to do is we're going to make each side of this big triangle, I'm going to draw it in purple here, let's make each side of this big triangle have a value of 2. Now, the reason why each side has a value of 2, it's an equilateral triangle. Do you guys know that word equilateral triangle? The reason why it's equilateral is that if this side right here was 60, and I've now mirrored its image over to here, that's also 60. And then if this was 30 right here and I doubled it to 30 over here, then it has a grand total of 60 as well. As soon as you have three sides that are all the angles that are all the same, it means the sides are all the same. So it means that this side right here is 2, and it means like this big side right here is 2 as well. However, you might say, well, Chris, why did you go with 2? Why not 5 or 1 or pi or something ridiculous like that? Uh, the reason why we went with 2 is that do we have this full triangle, though? Well... Actually, I'm only talking about using, I know I drew it in, but I cut that triangle in half, though, didn't I? Now, this side over here, did that side get cut in half? That's a two. But this big side right over here, it was two, but now I cut it in half. Now what is it? Yeah, that's why I picked two, because now that I cut it in half, this side right here is one. And then this side over here is root three. And... You'll either memorize that pretty quickly, or if you want me to show you why it's root 3, there's a simple explanation. It's actually Pythagoras' theorem. You guys remember the Pythagoras' theorem about how a squared plus b squared equals c squared? The, the rationale as to why the side is root 3 comes from this. I'm going to take c squared. I'm going to minus a squared. That should give b squared. So the way that works is if I go c squared minus a squared, it should be equal to b squared. 2 squared minus 1 squared equals b squared. This is 4 minus 1, which means that b is, uh, well, b squared was 3, so b is root 3. In a few slides, I'm going to show you how this can be useful in solving exact values. But I'm going to pause on that for a second, though. Everybody understand how I came up with root 3 on the side right here? Okay. Let me show you the other triangle here, and then I'll show you how we use it in a second. This is an isosceles triangle. The reason why I know it's isosceles is because if these are both 45s right here, they have the same angle. And if you have two of the same angle, it means that this side and this side here must be the same as each other. So what we do on this triangle here is we say, well, let's make this side be 1. And then this side right here will also have to be 1 because that's the property of isosceles triangles. 
Well, then if I want to find what the hypotenuse is, I do something very similar. This side can be A, this side can be B, this side here can be C. Only this time when I'm solving, what I'm doing is I'm going A squared plus B squared to give C squared. So it's 1 squared plus 1 squared. 1 plus 1 gives you 2. So C ends up being root 2. And so you get these two triangles right here. And we're going to use these to help us solve what we call exact values. Let me show you how now. Let's find an example. Here's an example. I like the golfer's pants, by the way. Stellar golfer pants. Okay, here's a scenario. A golfer is going to strike a ball with a 35-inch long golf club. And he strikes the ball in such a way that the club makes a 60-degree angle with the ground. My question is, tell me exactly how high the golfer's hands are above the ground. So if you can kind of see this picture, I'm going to draw a triangle in here. Here's the triangle. Here's his hands. Here's him hitting the golf ball off the ground. And if you can see, I've got kind of a triangle put inside there. Can you guys visualize that? Do you need in? She doesn't know his keys. What, your car keys don't work? <laughs> okay, so if you guys can visualize this triangle, I'm going to put in some values here. It says that his golf club is 35 inches. So that means that this side right here is 35 inches. Can you guys see that color well enough, by the way? Is purple sufficient for visualizing? Uh, it says that the club makes a 30, 60 degree angle with the ground. So right here, this is 60 degrees right there. Uh, this should be a right angle. I know I didn't say it as much, but I'm kind of presuming that the ground and the person makes a right angle, unless he's playing on like really uneven terrain. Let's assume the ground is flat. What I'm asking you for then is, let's find this side right here. How, how high is his hands above the ground? Now, you guys have already learned how to do this in grade 10. This is one of my big pet peeves about learning trig, is that this was Sokotoa. And sometimes you kind of forget about doing Sokotoa. So I, I put this example in just to remind you. Uh, sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. Tan is equal to opposite over adjacent. Do you guys remember these three things here? Which one should I use? Based on the angle I have right here, what is 35? Okay, so I mean I need to use one of these two. Based on the 60 degrees right here, this x side right here is the opposite. Come on, there we go. So we should use sine. So what I could say then is that sine of my 60 degree angle is equivalent to the opposite over 35. This is what you guys learned in grade. 9 or 10, I think. For sure grade 10, because I know I taught a few of you this. How do you solve for x? Sure, yeah. What edge is pointing at? T times the 35 up, right? But here's the issue. If you take 35 and you times by sine of 60 in your calculator, I'll show you what happens here. 35 times sine of 60 gives you the answer 30.3108893. Make sense? There's a problem. This is now needing to be rounded, and rounding is inherently bad, especially in the engineering and science fields. So I want to show you a little trick on how we do exact values. What we're going to do right here is we're going to substitute out the sine 60, and I'm going to do that using this triangle back here. So I'm, I'm going to erase all my mess here. I'm sorry that. You guys can't do quite the same thing here, but I'm going to use these old triangles here again. Um, this triangle right here, when I had written some sides on the edge of it, this was, uh, I believe, a 1, a 2, and a root 3. Okay. Well, use this triangle right here. See how there's a 60 degree right here in the corner? Let's figure out what sine of 60 is on this triangle here. On this triangle right here, sine of 60 degrees would be the opposite. Okay, well, compared to 60 right here, what's the opposite? Yeah, the root 3 is across from it. And then sine is opposite over hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is 2. Here's what I'm going to do. 
I know I'm on two different slides here, but hopefully you guys are on the same piece of paper. I'm going to take sine 60 right here and say, well, it's equal to root 3 over 2. I'm going to go over to this slide right here. And you see how I wrote sine 60 right here? I'm not going to write sine 60 anymore. I'm still going to write the 35, but sine 60 is going to get substituted with root 3 over 2, which means here's my exact value answer. 35 root 3 over 2 is my exact value. What I've done is I've replaced the sine of 60 with something else. Watch this. I'm going to grab my calculator. Previously, I did this. Let's just make sure my mode's on degrees. Previously, I did uh, 35 times the sine of 60. And hopefully you were in agreement with me. Uh, that is not going to work very well as, as an exact value. Now, we can cheat in our calculators and store it or write down all the digits. But this is exact. 35 cubed root 3, or square root 3, divided by 2. That gives me the exact same number, only this is unrounded. So the way you solve this is actually really simple. You do whatever you normally do. It's just if you ever get a 30 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, or a 45 degree angle, you use one of these special triangles, and you write down what this would be on this triangle right here, and then you substitute it, pardon me, into your other equation. And then it gets rid of needing to do trigonometry. So uh, here I have them written one more time. Um, it probably would be worthwhile for you guys to write them down somewhere and memorize them. If you have a formula sheet because you're in my 30-1 class, maybe write it on there. Here's the triangles one more time. This is a 1. This is a 2. That's a root 3. And on this triangle here, it's 1, 1, and root 2. Uh, this slide right here basically summarizes the same sort of thing. So why don't I try another example here just to make sure you guys are, because I don't think one example is enough. That's why I have two. So here's a scenario. you got a firefighter. He is going to put a ladder up against the wall. And I'm going to tell you that the window is 18 feet high. So that means that from here to here is 18 feet. I'm also going to tell you that in order to do this safely, he's going to make this a 45 degree angle right here. My question for you is, what is the exact length of ladder he needs? Nine times out of ten, we don't need to do it exactly. But there are some fields, hopefully you can appreciate, where we don't want to round. We want to know what exactly it is. And so our answer is going to involve some sort of square root, like square root of two or three or five or something. You guys get the initial setup here? OK, this angle is 45. How does 18 compare to this 45 right here? OK. So I think we're going to use sine. Because sine of our angle is the opposite over the hypotenuse. And this is the opposite. And this is the hypotenuse. OK, so I'm going to write out sine of 45 degrees is equal to my opposite, which is 18, over my hypotenuse which is x. Now, I could go to my calculator and type in sine of 45, but I don't want to. What I want to do instead is I want to substitute sine of 45 with a ratio that I can either memorize or look up or something like that. So I want to go back a slide here, because they were all on the slide right here. Here was my uh, triangle. Sine of 45 would be like right here. Sine of 45 would have been the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is 1 over root 2. But I want to point this out here. This is actually root 2 over 2. Does anybody know why it's root 2 over 2 rather than 1 over root 2? It's called rationalizing the denominator. We did this in one of our earlier units if you're in 20-1. What you end up doing is you times by root 2 over root 2. Remember doing this at all? It's been a few units. And what ends up happening is root 2 on root 2 on the bottom just becomes 2. And then 1 times root 2 on the top becomes root 2. 
here's, here's what I'm saying then, is in this example right here, see how there's a sign 45 right here? I am going to substitute this, this, with whatever, what sign 45 equals. So I'm going to substitute it with uh, root 2 over 2. So going back here, I'm going to call this root 2 over 2 equals 18 over x. Okay, now solve for x. Cross multiply. x times root 2 will equal 36. Get small that bit. Uh, divide both sides by root 2. There, x is equal to whatever 36 divided by root 2 is. Here, let me prove it to you. If I were to have gone back up top here, the way I would have solved for x is it would have been 18 divided by sine of 45. If you did 18 divided by sine of 45, that gives me an answer. But that's, an un that's a rounded number. I don't want that number, right? A better answer is 36 divided by root 2. It should be the exact same thing, only this is now exact. Only they probably wouldn't write it like this. Josh, are you a step ahead of me? What are you, what are you suggesting here? Yeah, you probably would rationalize this too. So you times by root 2 over root 2. And what it would give you then is 36 root 2. And then root 2 times root 2 literally is 2. And then 36 and 2 divides to give you 18 root 2. And this is probably the best answer. But now, now we have an exact value. <coughs> My grade 12. Do you guys remember doing this last year a little bit? Okay. You still need these skills next year. So that's why we're doing this review, because you need these skills in 30-1. Uh, for those of you who this is new curriculum 2, do you get the basic premise here? We're going to basically, in place of writing sine 45 or cosine 30 or tan 60, what we're going to do is we're going to substitute in its place a ratio. And that ratio is going to have one of these three things to it. It's either going to be like 3 over 2 or root 2 over 2 or 1 half. And we're going to replace it. And that gives us a exact value. Does that make sense to anybody that was new to? You definitely need some practice of this. Because I know it's like comes out of nowhere as to what we're doing. Okay. No, you need to memorize those three triangles, unfortunately, when it comes up for you guys more later. Okay, Okay. today's lesson, by the way, is kind of a hodgepodge. Um, I basically have four different sub-things we're going to learn. We first talked about making something an, uh, be on a, a standard position. And then I talked to you guys a little bit about exact values. The third thing I want to talk about is something called radians. Okay, so today is kind of like a mismatch of just random intro topics. Um, you guys know how on your calculator there's the ability to change your calculator to radians? You guys have seen this before. If you go to mode right here, there's radians and degrees. If you've even noticed that up till now, or even if you haven't, maybe you've been told, you know, just turn it to degrees. But maybe you've wondered, like, what the heck is a radian? Okay. The next thing I need to do is talk to you guys a bit about what a radian is. Okay. Um, why are there 360 degrees in a circle? By what rationale is there 360 degrees in a circle? Why not 57 or 293? It's kind of arbitrary to some degree. No pun intended. To, to some degree, it's arbitrary. Uh, go ahead, actually. Yeah, there, there's a couple of theories. Um, one of the theories is that 360 degrees divides by nearly everything. 360 divides by 1, obviously. Divides by 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It doesn't divide by 7. It does divide by 8, 9, 10, and 12, and 15. And so some people theorize that the reason why we went with 360 degrees in a circle is due to that. Another theory is actually based on a year again. There are 365 days in a year. 360 is close enough. But, but I mean, if I were to ask you why 360 degrees in a circle, like the first time I teach my daughter, when she goes to like grade three about angles, and I say, there are 360 degrees in a circle. Why? Like, what rationale is there? Well, there really isn't. You know, they just picked an arbitrary number and said that there's 360 in a circle. Radians are actually a much more useful measure of, of um, 
of angles because there's more of like a reason behind why they were designed. Now, that being said, though, uh, I think it actually makes sense that we measure in degrees because if I were to give you a triangle like this and I were to say estimate that angle right there, most of you can probably say eh, 50 degrees. And maybe you might think 45 or 60, but it's pretty easy to estimate degrees. You get what I'm saying? If I were to say estimate this angle right here, most of you would be able to say, well, it's definitely more than 90. It's definitely less than 180. Looks like it's maybe 150 degrees. So that is one of the useful things to radians, or to degrees. But degrees is arbitrary. This is how a radian works. A radian is actually an older unit of measurement than degrees. Uh, it's more historical. It basically, I like to call it my perfect slice of pizza. And I think that's actually one of my next slides on here. Um, so I'm going to go to that slide here. You guys ever gone to, like, say, Costco, and they have, like, those big pizza slices there? Okay. A radian is like a perfect slice of pizza, because here's why. A radian is when you have an angle in such a way that however far it is along this radius right here, it's the exact same farness distance, farness, from here to here. And it's also the exact same distance around the edge here. If this were, like, say, 9 well, you can't even see that. This is a new color. If this were nine inches from here to here, and it were also nine inches from here to here, the area around the edge, if it is one radian, is also nine inches. That's what makes something a radian. It's like this perfect three-sided, but it's not a triangle, though. You guys get why it's not a triangle? Because although this side right here and this side right here meet at an angle, there's a curve along the edge here. But it's almost like it's an equilateral triangle. Okay, now, you know how an equilateral triangle has 60 degrees? Uh, this is not quite 60 degrees. It's about 57 degrees. And that's because you have to, like, curve around the edge. But that's a radian. Okay? And it actually makes a lot of sense then. Because we now measure an angle based on how far the edge is. We call that an arc compared to the radius. So I'm going to go back a slide now here which is still on the same page for you guys. A radian is a very exact way of measuring an angle. And the way it works is that this right here is a radius. Because clearly you're going from the middle of the circle to the edge, right? That's a radius. And you're also going from here to here. That's also going to be a radius. Well, if the edge length here, known as an arc, if that is the exact same, you have one radian. What ends up happening then, if you look at a picture like, say, this, I'll go to this one here to flip pages, is that this right here, this little cutout, is like a perfect measure. If this was 7 and this was 7, then around the edge was also 7. And that's called a radian. Okay. Now, just for perspective, a radian is about 57 degrees. But again, this is about. And this is one of the problems with degrees. You guys know how when you type in your calculator sine 20 or cosine 43, it's going to give you decimal values? The reason why is that degrees are a very imprecise measurement tool to work with. Radians are actually much more effective if you know how to use them, hence the reason why I've got to show you guys. Um, you guys know how a circle has a circumference of 2 pi r? You guys seen that formula before? Circumference is 2 pi r. If you went all the way around a circle like this, the circumference, that is 2 pi r. That's your arc length. Well, the way a radian works is a radian, well, that's probably hard to see now, isn't it? A radian is defined as the amount of angle you have. Which one is it again here? A radian is defined as the amount of arc length you have divided by your angle. If your arc length going all the way around a circle is a 2 pi r, and you have exactly one radian, what ends up happening is radius cancels, and you actually end up getting two pi radians in a circle, which this is confusing at first. So I need to show you a better picture. I want to show you this picture right here. Again, imagine you're at Costco, and you want to go buy that perfect slice of pizza. It's not too big. It's not too thin. You're not getting a chintzy little one here. This is the perfect slice of pizza. How many slices of pizza can you get out of a circle, out, out of one big full pizza, right? Well, you can get one. Oh, this thing just shut off on me.
There you go. You can get one, two, three, four, five, six perfect slices of pizza. And then you got like a little like quarter slice in here. It's actually not a quarter. It's actually 0.28 left over. Well, what ends up happening is you can get exactly 6.28 slices of pizza. But you know what 6.28 is equivalent to? 2 pi. Because you guys know how pi is 3.14? Take a 3.14, which is pi, and double it, and you get 6.28. And the reasoning for that I had on the previous slide here. The reason for it is that if you go all the way around a circle, circumference-wise, all the way around here is 2 pi r. But if you're dividing that by a, an angle, which is like a radius, an r right here, what ends up happening is the r's cancel. 2 pi r divided by r cancels. And it means that you can fit 2 pi angles here. Now, here's what makes that really useful for you. You guys know how in the previous slides, we were working with like root 2 and root 3 as a way to do an exact value? Well, now when we work with angles, rather than having to round angles and estimate them, now what we do is we talk about how much of pi there is. Not pi being like the yummy eating kind of pi, but like pi meaning how much of pi there is as an exact value. And so this is a clever way of having an exact angle. So it takes a little while to wrap your head around this. So if you're looking at me going, Chris, you lost me, bear with me, okay? Like this is, we're, we're just kind of beginning here. So bear with me, okay? Let's try an example here. What I want to do is I want to show you how to convert between angles and degrees. And the note I have at the bottom here is that what we're going to do from now on is we're going to try to measure things in fractions of pi as an angle. And this is very exact now. Okay. Let's try the first one here. Let's try to find pi over 4 as degrees. And before I do that, we should actually graph what pi over 4 is so you get an idea of it. So I'm going to make a big circle here. Here's a circle. This is like your whole pizza. How far is it all the way around the whole circle? Again, you guys remember? 6.28. So all the way around the circle is 2 pi. That's how far it is to go all the way around the circle. 6.28. Okay. Now what if I only wanted you to go halfway around the circle? How much would halfway around the circle be if the whole way around the circle is 2 times pi? Halfway around the circle would just be pi, yeah. Okay. Which actually, this is also very useful as well. Remember my initial story about talking about how the sun would start in the east and rise in the west? Well, what they basically said is that there are pi degrees that the sun is going to go through. It's going to go from here all the way to there. And by the time you're done, that is pi radians. Not pi degrees, but pi radians. That's a very, very exact number because pi is like, pi goes on infinitely. You know, it's 3.14159, etc., etc. Well, let's say I wanted you to find me a quarter of pi. So I know it's above me here, but see how this is pi over 4? Whereabouts would a quarter of pi be? Well, if this right here, if fully flat across is pi, then wouldn't right here be half of pi, and wouldn't right here, this would be a quarter of pi. Now, follow this logic here. If you're in agreement that all the way around the circle is 2 pi, because this formula of circumference is 2, 2 pi r, and halfway around the circle is pi, and then a quarter away around the circle would be like, say, half of pi, then right here is a quarter of pi. I can tell you what that angle is going to be. That's going to be 45 degrees. You know why it's 45 degrees? Because isn't from here to here 90? But if you cut 90 in half, doesn't that make it 45? And so what I want to train you guys how to be able to do is rather than calling this 45 degrees, I need you to be able to say that it's pi over 4 radians. And what we end up getting then is fractions of pi. Let's try another one. I'm going to try to graph 5 pi over 6. So I'm going to erase some of the stuff and I'll do it again here. Okay. 
So again, let's make ourselves a circle. We're going to start in the east. We're going to rotate our whole circle around. If we went all the way around the circle, it's 2 pi. So if we go halfway around the circle, it's pi. What I want to do now is I want to do 5 sixths of pi. So you can almost like break this up into chunks. From here to here, I need to break it up into six pieces. So why don't I do it something like this? Here's one, two, three, four, five, six. So I broke it up into six pieces. One, two, three, four, five, six. And I want five sixths of this. So five sixths means I need to go all the way around to there. This filled in section now is now five sixths of pi. So again, where the heck did this come from? All the way around the circle has been defined as two pi. Why? Okay, well the reason why is that there's 2 pi r in a circle, but the way an, a radian works is that you divide by the radius, which means that all the way around is just 2 pi. It means that halfway is 1 pi, and if we want 5 sixths of pi, I've now drawn in 5 sixths of pi. It's not 5 sixths of the whole circle, but it's 5 sixths of half our circle. How many degrees is this going to be about? Yeah, it's actually 150. Yeah, because you can see that this is a, uh, it's more than 90, right? 90 degrees would be right here. This is 180 degrees right here. This is actually going to be uh, 150 degrees. Let me show you another way of doing this. Remember how we said that all the way around the circle was 2 pi? What's all the way around the circle in degrees? Okay, so I want to show you a little conversion you can use here. If you were to take 5 pi over 6, and you were to times by 360 degrees in every 2 pi radians, because what I'm saying is that all the way around the circle in degrees is 360. All the way around the circle in radians is 2 pi. You see how pi is going to cancel? I just need the calculator here. What is 5 times 360 divided by 6 and divided by 2? That's 150. There, I managed to find a way to convert a fraction of pi into a degree. Using that same logic, I'm not going to draw this next one here. I'll just do the same thing here. If I gave you 3 pi over 8, and I wanted you to tell me what that is in degrees, times by 360 degrees, divide by 2 pi, pi will cancel, and you'll be left with uh, 3 times 360, divided by 8, divided by 2, gives me 67.5 degrees. Now, that direction there where I'm trying to change from radians to degrees may seem like, Chris, why can't we just stick with degrees? But the reason why is on the next example is right here. Sometimes degree values are 57.953 degrees. Like sometimes you get inexact values. And so what we can do is rather than working in degrees, sometimes working in radians makes more sense because radians can always be written as a fraction of pi, regardless of what the degree happens to be. So I'm going to start with an easy one like 30. If you've got 30 degrees, if I want to write this as fractions of pi, you know how right here I was timesing by 360 and dividing by 2 pi? Flip it. Times by 2 pi and divide by 360 degrees, what's going to happen is your degree signs are going to cancel. However, don't use pi. When you when you like solve this, go 3 times 2 divided by 360, but don't don't use pi as part of your equation. So like do something like this. Rather than typing in, oh, come on, why is this not going away? Hmm. My calculator is broken. Huh, that's really strange. Okay. Anyways, I can't show it on the screen. Can you guys grab your calculators and type, type along with me? 
go three times two, 30 times two. Don't press pi though. Go 30 times two, divide by 360. You're hopefully gonna get 1.666 repeating. If you guys know how to do a fraction on your calculator, go math fraction. That means that it's one sixth of pi. We now know how many fractions of pi we have. I better try a few more examples here because I know this is not going to sink in until we try a few more. Let's say I give you 120 degrees. 120 degrees. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to times by 2 pi, and I'm going to divide by 360. The reason why is that 2 pi is all the way around the circle if you're talking about radians. 360 is all the way around the circle if you're talking about degrees. I'm going to cancel the degree signs. If I take 120 and I times by 2 and divide by 360 and make it a fraction, I get 2 thirds. That means it's two-thirds of pi. Here's what that means. I'm going to just draw a new, new slide right here. If this is zero and that's pi, here's the first third of pi. Here's the second third of pi. Here's the third third of pi. Here's, here's first third. Here's the second third. Here's the third third of pi. If I need two-thirds of pi, it means that I need all of this filled in from here to here. And guess what? That's a... Uh, 120 degrees then. Okay, it's for this final example that it now matters. You can then do this for any angle. If it is a angle to the nearest ones or even a decimal, like say I give you 153 degrees, I should be able to turn 153 degrees into a fraction of pi. All you've got to do is times by 2 pi and divide by 360, except don't times by pi, right? So go 153 times by 2, divide by 360, make it a fraction and I ended up getting 17 out of 20 pi. Here's what that means. If I were to ask you to graph 153 degrees, do you guys think that you would be very confident in your ability to graph 153 degrees precisely and do it well? No, probably not. I bet you could estimate it very well, but I don't think you could do it exactly. But I'm very confident that I could plot 17 twentieths of pi. Here's how I do that. If I needed to plot 17 twentieths of pi, here's my circle, pi is the halfway point. If I need to plot twentieths of pi, let's just start breaking up into sections. Like this could be one, two, three, four. See how I've broken up into fourths? So this is like, uh, this is uh, uh, four, sorry, this is five twentieths. This is 10 twentieths, I just want to grab the door, this would be 15 twentieths, this would be 20 twentieths, I need 17 twentieths, so if between 15 and 20, I need to get 17, I better break this up into 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so this would be where 16 twentieths would be, this, this would be 15 twentieths, this would be 16 twentieths, right here, this one would then be 17 20ths of pi. I now know that my angle is all the way around there. That's 17 20ths of pi. Now at first it seems dumb because you're like, why aren't we working with degrees? I'm going to stop here, by the way, because I know we're kind of running on steam here. Radiance is a, is a more effective way of measuring things because you're always measuring things in percentages of pi, and that means you're never rounding. You're never getting 13.517 degrees. 13.517 degrees can be made into a percentage of pi. Does that make sense? And that's why it's going to always be exact. Okay. And so it, it's not going to be very useful until we move forward and do a few more tasks. But hopefully, hopefully that started to make a little bit of sense as to how the radians works. So radians is always going to be a fraction of pi. Pi is halfway around your circle. 2 pi is the whole way around your circle. Does that make sense? Okay. Why don't we end that there for now? Because that's uh, that's a lot to bite off. Tomorrow, what I'll do is I'll finish off what I didn't get to today, and then we'll kind of move forward from there. So, you guys have any questions for me? For you guys that are in my uh, 30 level class, you guys recall a little bit of this? Okay. okay. If you guys are in 20-1, please don't freak out. It, it's going to take a little while for this to sink in. Okay. So if you're like going, oh my goodness, what just happened? Um, 
Please be patient with me.